Hello, welcome to the Overlap Rugby Podcast. I'm Shane, that's Dara. Hello. And we're back. <laughs> um, yes, it's been quite a while. It's been This is our first show of 2020, and uh, it's a bit of a strange circumstance to be bringing you a rugby podcast, given the amount of things that have happened. I believe the last show we were doing was a Champions Cup special of some kind uh, prior to prior to Christmas. Oh, and uh, yeah. yeah, we ended like there, there were a fair. It feels like three lifetimes since uh, have gone since then. There were a few. We had some personal issues that prevented us from doing any uh, podcast around Christmas, and then we missed out on the Six Nations because the Six Nations got halfway through and it was getting kind of juicy. France were looking good for a while. They were. Um, and yeah, now we're obviously in this surreal lockdown world. We're coming to you from lockdown in Dublin, um, I, wherever you may be. I hope you're safe and sound and uh, keeping healthy and yeah, all that. Yeah, yeah. But oh, geez, um, it's been it's been uh, <laughs> it's been, surreal, it's been crazy it? times yeah. all over, and you know, obviously the whole world's now dealing with a with a global pandemic and. You know, wishing everybody the safest and the best as well. And you know, there've been, you know, since I was, I was just musing in the rugby world since we last did our show. You know, in the in the backdrop of a magnificent World Cup and yeah. everything looking rosy. There's been so many. Um, you know, we've had obviously uh, personal disappointments, but uh, you know, the Samoa had a had a measles outbreak that was that was pretty horrific, and Australia had wildfires, and now obviously everybody's dealing with this pandemic, and it just feels like uh, very tumultuous times in the in the rugby world. So, um, yeah, wherever we are, you are. Hopefully, hopefully you can stay safe and, and and be happy. And obviously, there's no rugby going on at the moment, which is pretty disappointing. But. Yeah. Uh, uh, circumstances have it that we are now utterly free. Uh, <laughs> yes, indeed, we are re- co- co- COVID jobless. Yes, uh, gig economy workers just taken out. Yeah, um, but <laughs> thankfully, um, uh, that has left us in a position where we can do podcasts yeah. about the no rugby that's happening. Indeed, um, yes. So you... there'll be a little bit of waffle. There'll be a little bit of bear with us. But um, you know, there are fun things we can talk about. You know, we can reflect on past games. We have a couple of videos in mind. Uh, just uh, one looking obviously ahead to I know it's a cliche at this point but looking ahead to next year's Lions tour which you know touch wood it goes ahead but um, obviously you know everybody's been doing it but I actually think there is value to it because it'll, it'll work well as a retrospective just to reveal the extent to which we know nothing a year out from competitions yes, about what's going to be what that's true like we're yeah. going to pick a Lions team that might make perfect sense which in, in, in 12 15 months time is going to look ridiculous Perhaps. which is great yeah um, because that just contextualizes things a little bit and it will happen for everything so i think we'll have a bit of fun doing that we're gonna we have a video in mind just looking at the all blacks and, and what happened to them how, how, you know what was the the heart of how how brilliant and how dominant they had been over the last decade or so how did they lose that yeah and how can they get it back um, and then we have a couple of less serious videos in mind as well stuff like um you know what's your favorite you know superhero what superhero make the best rugby rugby uh, uh player or something team, along cetera. those lines yeah we'll, um, we'll, we'll find some content for you guys and very much open yeah. to ideas as well in terms of what you'd like us to talk about are there any games you'd like us to take a retrospective look at any great teams we'd like yeah. you'd like to take us to take a look at um, you know, obviously, I don't know how many of you are sticking around with us because we've been gone so long. But um, <laughs> if there are any of you, if you if you've any interest in in any particular video from us, we, we we'd absolutely love to hear from you. For sure, for sure. But uh, in the meantime, we we are going to talk about one thing that is topical in the rugby world at the moment, which is um, the elections for the World Rugby. Um, the well, the, the the head on show, I guess, in terms of the next yes, four yeah, years, yeah. we have uh, incumbent Bill Beaumont and. Uh, up and coming star slash former vi- former v- current v- vice president. Yeah. Um, well, he kind of he did step down, uh, I believe, yeah. a few uh, few months ago, just to do to run uh, August and P show. Um, obviously, the the vote I think has happened or is happening over the few days as we shoot this is Monday, and um, so this will probably be up by Tuesday. Um, but uh, we won't know until mid May the results of that election. Um, but it is an interesting one. It's 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 very rare that these elections are carried out in the public domain. But obviously, as we've alluded to there's nothing else to talk about in rugby so it has been kind of pushed yep. to the forefront of, of the rugby media world and uh, it is definitely consequential they're, they're very interesting uh, kind of yin, yin and yang thing here there's de- there's definitely a narrative of uh, of kind of old school kind of establishment politics in, in Bill Beaumont and who is the incumbent yeah, yeah. incumbent versus kind of the maverick of uh, of Gus Pichot, which is a nice narrative there's also the north northern it's, hemisphere southern hemisphere yes. divide that is possibly more pertinent it's definitely it, more pertinent. yeah well no i wouldn't say I, def- I wouldn't say definitely both of those dynamics exist yeah in part because p show has played it up i mean p show in in a like he is a politician he is he's like yeah. he's, he's this young, he's got charisma yeah he's he speaks very well and charismatic and mm. he's ran a good media campaign obviously in this 
you know, um, media, uh, sports media desert. Yeah. He has just uh, stolen the headlines with, you know, and he's positioned himself very, very brilliantly and, and given himself as good a chance as he can against, you know, the, the, the wise old dogs in, in, uh, in, in Beaumont and, and, um, uh, um, the friend, our French friend Bernard Laporte. Bernard Laporte. Um, yes. Uh, yeah. It's it's definitely interesting that like, it's tough to like. There's pros and cons to both. We've re- we've read both manifestos. Um, they like they all but both all parties involved have interesting ideas for for where they kind of see the game going. It's just hard to like we we have evidence based on Bill Bowman's tenure there. We don't really with Pichot. We don't know well, some and with Pichot, some with Pichot. There's there's also limits to just the the sway that World Rugby has. Even the head of World Rugby when there's there are, are vice like grips things like the French domestic leagues and things like the English Union the the All Blacks as well. Mm. There's there are a few more powers at play than just World Rugby. Yeah. It sounds all in encompassing when you say world rugby but it's not actually mm. um but it is it is interesting in terms of uh there some of them are some of their uh, mantras are very different and some of their ideals are, are very different yeah uh, in terms of just where they want to bring the game and where they see the game as being uh all right at the moment there's the, uh, the, i suppose we can we can lay out the benefits or or drawbacks of either i don't know which would you like to start with will we start with the well, challenger or yeah, the no, incumbent? I, think, I, think, I think i think the incumbent is probably a decent place to start in terms yeah. of where we're at with bill beaumont um, yeah like there, there are there are successes he can point to um mm-hmm. One of the things that World Rugby has been emphasizing that they do have a lot of control over. Like, I mean, they, they, a lot of the emphasis of this campaign has been, you know, structured tournaments, yeah, um, which can be a bit of a red herring in terms of, you know, actually generating income for, um, for for World Rugby in terms of actually, you know, no matter how many times you restructure a tournament and do this and that and this and that with it, it's it's not actually a, a decent substitute for just the fundamentals of growing the game in, in, in different countries and, you know, investing at a grassroots level and instilling a love in the game in, in, a, in, a, in a more broad base of countries than we currently have. Yeah. That's usually the solution to make more money, whereas really like, there's an element of just trying, to, of, of, of with, the, with the tournament restructures that are being suggested by everybody of just, tossing the deck aside and trying to stack it in a different way so that it creates more money with yeah. the same with the same materials and and you know there's, that's definitely folly there's, it's um, it does it doesn't seem like that's the wisest idea but what bill moment has emphasized uh in his tenure in world rugby uh is a law changes mm. and he can point to some successes in terms of the tackle area you yeah. know he's brought clarity to that area where there hasn't been clarity and he's brought a bit more safety i think probably true definitely um, true in fact yeah and maintained and like and it, it, it's maintained it's entertaining entertainment faction you can still defend you can still attack but the laws around the tackle law have been gotten under control and likewise the scrum yeah there's more sense and reason to the scrum than yeah. there would have been 10 years ago well certainly even in, the, in the crouch and... touch pause engage year where that, yeah. that was where it reached its height of just maddening mm. you couldn't get through a scrum you had scrums that lasted yeah. 10 minutes that was the wayne mm. barnes kind of 100 minute game of scrum resets yeah. was around then as well and um, it's much clearer now there's a much more of a rhythm and yeah. you can technical scrummaging is getting rewarded as well like yeah. there are really great technical scrummagers out there getting it's, the benefits it's from a gra- it. it's a great um, error for the scrum then um, their innovative ideas are still coming through like the 50 22 kicking rule they're only being introduced yeah. at the moment obviously whenever we get out of this mm-hmm. um you know we're going to see that being introduced um, more than likely um there are you know there are good ideas um that are being approached reasonably um, coming from World Rugby at the moment, and Bill po- Bill Beaumont can point to that as a, as a massive success, and that's yeah. an area of great emphasis for him. Um, the big issue, I think, the big sort of elephant in the room, and the frustration that a lot of people have, mm-hmm. is just the current system of you know they pay lip service to it being a global game, yeah, but the Six Nations has just a colossal sway, yeah. And and all, it's holding all the cards. Um, they hold all the cards, yeah. and they have, you know, a, a t- they don't have an interest. Let's be real; they don't have a massive interest in making the game global, go global. No, um, the well, likes of Scotland, Ireland, you know, Wales, Italy, like none of them would trade, you know, three more competitive European nations for a threat to their current position. Yeah. And which is unfortunate because that's small minded thinking on on in terms of oh, uh, the game, but yeah, it's yeah. It, there like there is value to the tradition of the Six Nations, there's certainly value in terms of the revenue of the Six Nations. And the Sanzar Nations would, would complain of it being unfair, but things like Super Rugby and Rugby Championship mm. just doesn't bring the same profit. And it's a small game, and you do need some flagship marquee tournaments as well. So I understand. Mm 
protecting the Six Nations tournament. But what I, I can't really abide in is there's some kind of cynical aspects to Beaumont's campaign as well, where he'll pat himself on the back because now Fiji has a vote at the table. But it's like they have one vote at the yeah. table. Like yeah, that's that's nothing. It's not a sway. Whereas mm-hmm. like the, the the deck is still heavily f- stacked in uh, mm. in Europe's favor, well, and it means li- that like li- going li- into li- this thing, basic things like where 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 money is divided, but where money is invested, yeah. and you know obviously it's easy to sell a team like Japan because Japan is a big country with a lot of money, mm-hmm. but. You know, it, it, the basic things like a, a, a promotion and relegation or a pathway to promotion and relegation in the Six Nations are just off the table mm-hmm. because of the opposition of those unions. And there's no indication from the from the Beaumont establishment that there's there's no urgency in, in changing that. Mm-hmm. And so... Which the, seems to be the frustration in Peace mm, Show that's led to him running part yeah, of, at least. Totally. And, and um, uh, just just a frustration in general with the, with the fact that they, like, Tier 2 sides... Uh, are, are, are getting a rough deal and th- like you get occasional little windfalls like Georgia can join the PNC the PNC is decent when it, when it does happen but they're all very peripheral they and there isn't a pathway to more competitive games at the top level and like that's a source of frustration and something that Pichot I think the biggest differential perhaps between them is that Pichot is advocating a more equitable vote share among about, yeah. among, among nations yes. so you know you're talking about you know Ireland gets one vote Fiji gets one vote Samoa gets one vote yeah. Tonga gets one vote that's perhaps the most progressive place that we could go and that's a lot of these unions are going to know what's best for themselves yes um, so giving giving them a more equitable say within the organisation is is perhaps the best way forward and that's the that's really where the challenge I think comes from it's yeah it's it's also where the kind of the difference in mantra comes from because because Bill Beaumont is a, is a huge rugby fan and, a, and a, an absolute rugby, like a legend of the game in many ways but he is not interested in changing that or shaking that up like there, mm. there's there, there's definitely there's people at the big table and there's people at the small small table and that doesn't see there's kind of ring fencing going on mm. with that at the moment in the current setup and he is the status quo well, that's what he represents there, there, um, there is ring fencing and mm. there are little 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 movements here and there to try and change that but anything and it's hard it's hard to envisage world rugby by themselves being able to change this but changing the, the vote shares would be a way to do it mm-hmm. but at the moment there is little can be done because the second anyone tries to shake up uh, any minor threat might appear to the, you know the presence of an Italy or a Scotland mm-hmm. or a France etc. Um, it'll just get quashed down. Yeah. Um, and it would behoove us b- before we just move on and take a broad look at Pichot. Yeah. Not, it, it would it would be remiss not to mention uh, the other sort of cloud over Beaumont's candidacy, which is sort of the presence of Bernard Laporte, the Francis Keane situation, which is which is not like massive in and of itself. It's just an indication of how business is done. Yeah. In the sense that it's like there's quid, there's quid pro quo going on where it's like. You second my nomination. I'll get you into the yeah. executive yeah. committee. And Hints of cronies. I couldn't everywhere. give a shite <laughs> if you're it, what you've done in your past. As long as you're on team me, and we're gonna just hush hush and let's do this thing. Yeah, and that's definitely the cloud that's, over. That's it. how it's, Bernard Laporte does business. I mean, this, you're talking about a guy who worked in the Sarkozy government, um, <laughs> and well. um, mm. and and that's how 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 potentially world rugby would operate I mean the, the most dangerous thing from this election is the prospect of four years time Bernard Laporte being head of world rugby that's true which is just a bad look for the game it's 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 like Sepp Blatter in FIFA like yes yeah. it's just a dreadful dreadful look for the game and these guys tend to look out for numero uno before they look out for anyone else for as well. sure it's yeah. not a good prospect for tier two sides and you you saw examples of that in the um in the in the 2023 world cup bid as well where yeah it's like very savvily you know, launching this media campaign. Like, I, I, frankly, I thought the whole thing was shady. Like, he he gets, Bernard Laporte gets a lot of criticism for the media campaign ripping the um, recommendation which gave it to South Africa and yeah. France took enough of the votes away. I thought the recommendation was trashed. The recommendation trashed Ireland's bid, which obviously we're self-interested, but r- reading through it, it was so, like, it, some of those critiques were so, were sparing in detail and mm. unbelievably harsh when it came to Ireland. And then, charitable when it came to South Africa yeah and so that knocked us out and then he led a campaign against South Africa and, and a campaign against the report in this way and that one yeah. the other way and, and what ended up happening is France got the nomination but it was it was dirty tricks and there was sort of a cloud over it mm-hmm. and that was the nature of Bernard de Port and just that whole thing yeah does leave an air like where where I think Pichot you know he's you know charismatic young politician he's not got the cleanest hands either but he's he's probably a step up 
Yeah, from that. for sure. And just in terms the, of the aesthetic of the game. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And it's it's also like even though he obviously he has been involved with it, he's like he he's a, a, a part of uh, of Laporte's or not Laporte of uh, Beaumont's team all through this last four years, and he is mm. quite a good outspoken part. He seems fr- generally frustrated with the slow pace of change, or just yeah. and seem seemingly fundamentally opposed on certain things. Um, he's 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 a southern he- southern hemisphere guy. He's he's an Argentinian guy. It's a, it's a new look for the game. The traditional powers in rugby. It, it yeah. uh, come from the northern hemisphere, and more more often mm-hmm. than not, England and France, and it's it's Six Nations, where, and it, that that goes way back. Even when you're thinking of the um, the this kind of Sanzar nation splitting to try and start the World Cup, which only mm-hmm. happened in like in the eighties, and it was coming yeah. for a long time, but again, it was Six Nations pushback that prevented it. Yeah, and so eventually, the six, the six Nations have a history throughout the mm-hmm. tenure of rugby. The the, the the sort of old boys club, they're mm-hmm. they're extremely protectionist. Yes. Yeah, and, Which, and like, you, yeah, like yeah. You, you'd like to think that that's changed, but then even little things like the Saris thing from last year showed just yeah. how how much it still is permeated in parts of the game. There's kind of a, a tradition of ducking the authorities or trying to do things yeah, underhandedly, yeah. and as as well as just <coughs> a protectionist streak of yeah. trying to mind the status quo. And um, whereas Pichot does represent kind of new blood in that regard, he mm. doesn't doesn't come from that uh, that tradition at all. He's no. he's more of a he feels like more of an earnest kind of just an optimist yeah. about the game and a bit of a dreamer sometimes. Some of the notions he's he's put forward in his manifesto do feel fanciful for the yeah, role that he's yeah, going yeah. for and for the tenure that he's going to uh, to have to do it. That like in four years, I don't know if if he can implement a a, a, a kind of global calendar year no. for for it. I, I don't know if that's even feasible. Well, that's that's on everybody. That's on um, everybody's. Everybody seems to be calling for that. But mm-hmm. I mean, you get to hear proposal that makes sense yeah um you know he has he has two tangible um tangible uh things that he can point to uh he is responsible primarily for argentina being in the rugby championship yes he championed that he, he campaigned did. for it he got it yeah um and that is just an like an unmitigated success story. it is yeah and yeah. it's one of those things where unless you have a young ambitious guy driving it it just doesn't get done and exactly. this is the exasperation like we how long have 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 we been saying and everybody been saying you know georgia deserve a pathway to the six nations yeah and it's just they don't like, have a peace show it's not gonna it. happen yeah like because they just won't make it happen yeah and they'll you know they'll give you crumbs here and crumbs there but ultimately the the level playing field needed to compete is just not going to be given short of them doing something like what japan have done yes um, which is it, like japan is a separate entity because it's a it's a massive co- uh, country and it's also unique in that like we're, we're like yeah. talking actually one, another thing in p show's thinking is his private investment thing he's a bit more open to it he, yeah, he does yeah. it's part of his manifesto he wants the likes of cvc involved yeah. which like is can be could be potentially dangerous but he's definitely right in saying they need we need outside investment and it needs to be dealt yeah. like he feels that uh in in his tenure with beaumont they have been in again just kind of protectionist and standoffish in terms of those those negotiations that do have to happen and like if you want the outset money there needs to be a clear purpose for it and there definitely needs to be profit for yeah, this yeah. like it, it's more complicated than uh, than the only thing is white. the only thing is like some of the rhetoric on that regard like the cvc thing is you know it's reported as a universal positive um it might be it's just, it might be it's money it's money into the game yeah it might be um like but I giving do. them a seat at the decision making table like I, the, the sort of venture capitalists that run these things tend to be interested in in one thing and one thing only which is you know profit and very often quick profit yeah uh, it's it's get in invest make a profit get out yeah and very often you know that can be at the expense of, of something that's been built any like, long term yeah. thinking well the thing about it is like it's not football football yeah. is a global economy all of its own yeah. and like you can it can subsist and survive even with the likes of Seth Blatter being corrupt as hell at the top of it. You can have, there's just so much money in that game that it's self-sustaining, and there's so much interest too. Yeah, yeah. Like rugby has to fight a bit more for that. So the notion, and you do see some notions from like uh, invest in the Premiership. We want to try and get rid of the Champions Cup because we want the Premiership to be this flagship thing, and we yeah, should yeah. ring fence the Premiership, and then hopefully people in America will watch, tune in on a Saturday to watch Gloucester face Bath. Yeah, and it's like yeah. that's never going to happen, like ever. And and yeah. No matter how much you wanted to to be um, in the Premier League, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, and it's tough. And it, it, mm. like it, it, the, the the sort of magic solutions that these guys are going to come up could be, you know, mm. um, bright and shiny enough to attract some sponsorship, and then all of a sudden CVC have made their profit and they're out. Yeah. And then long term, there isn't anything sustainable there, mm-hmm. and it doesn't end up working. And that would be one of the the, the sort of one of the the, risk, the risks mm-hmm. that I would associate with a P show presidency is just falling for 
a sort of a quick attractive solution yeah, to, a, to problem, a complicated like, problem to a complicated problem he's also like, he's seen, it, I, I know it was Bernard Laporte's idea um, so you know it, it, it's as much a critique of, of, of everyone as it is of, of Pichot but like this Club World Cup idea that pops up which you know on paper kind of sexy you know, who doesn't want to see you know Leinster play the Crusaders or Saracens play you know the Sharks or you know yeah. etc yeah, it's, it's a fun idea but first of all, in practice, it's going to be very difficult to work for player welfare, etc. And yeah. second of all, there's just there's just no guarantee that that's going that, to be that a better product than what the Champions Cup is. Exactly, currently. there's no guarantee at all. Yeah. And the more you tinker, the less people get invested. Yes, which as is, you can see with Super Rugby, like, yeah, that's been constantly in flux for the last yeah. ten years. And what we've seen is dwindling interest, and to the point yeah. where Australia, the Australian Union, is now in crisis because they yeah. can't. They can't compete for eyeballs with all the other sport. Like Australia yeah. is a sports mad country, and there's a lot of sport happening in it. And rugby is getting kind of consumed by all that because there's no like the Super Rugby. A few years ago, the Lions got to the final of it without ever playing in New Zealand because the format yeah. was so nuts. So um, you don't want to be chopping and chopping up what's already good just for the sake of what might make a quick book or what looks potentially interesting on paper. Yeah, um, exactly. And there, there's there's definitely a concern with that. And that's a concern on both fronts. But mm -hmm. it does seem as though Pichot, even though this is this particular example is, is Laporte's idea, it seems as though Pichot is more likely to be sort of aggressive and knee-jerky mm -hmm. um, with, with, with massive changes to format than, you know, your more old school protectionist Bill Beaumont. Yeah. Although, you know, until until a more equitable uh, voting system within the organisation works, nothing is going to happen short, shy of the approval of, of, you know, the Six Nations unions. That's true. Um, yeah. Although, you know, it's important to note in the context of this election, the Six Nations unions are behind Beaumont, but in general, they aren't a monolith and very often England no. and France can be swayed. They can. Um, they can be swayed by, by money. More yeah, often exactly. Than and, not. And, and neither um, union has a particular loaf for the Champions Cup as we know. Yes, um, which is unfortunate really because yes. it's the best club competition in the game. No question. <laughs> and, cer and certainly uh, it would be it would be a shame especially for us Irish fans if, if, for sure. if that was to go away. Um, listen, before we move on, obviously from Pichot, it's just as 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 it as it would be remiss of us not to mention um, the Laporte issues and the Francis Keane issues hanging hanging over Bill Beaumont. Um, there are a couple of potential conflicts of interest with with Pichot that, sure. that just haven't been reported. Um, so he he has a um, a job with the Australian billionaire who set up the. Um, uh, breakaway competition, you know the one with the Western Force, etc. Yeah, yeah. Pichot works for him in South America in some capacity. Uh, he's on the board of um, USA Rugby at the moment. Um, yeah. Uh, so like, there's just there's just a couple. He also has his own media company, which is has ties to ESPN, etc. And there are that could, there be are, po could be a positive, but it's also it's, yeah, well, there's it's, just it's conflict, in, conflicts of interest. And apparently, World Rugby have rules that say that if you do have such conflicts of interest, you're not going to be able to attend some meetings, etc. Which mm. can really work if you're the head of World Rugby. And, and just none of this has been discussed in the context of his nomination, which sure. is weird. But yeah, you know, he's run a very savvy media campaign, and it hasn't come up. So. No, one thing that um, was brought up by uh, was it Leo the the. Um, just the uh, it, from a Pacific Islander point of view, Pisho is very very rigid on the um, eligibility rules, eligibility rules right. which is is a problem if you're a, a Tongan pro and and, mm. and and want to be repatriated, or if you're the likes of a Malachi Fekato or a Charles Pieta who have, have a few caps for the All Blacks but can't now contribute yeah. to either feature. It's something. That, it's a very popular idea in the islands for obvious reasons. You mm -hmm. know, first of all, the, the the idea of nationality as a as a rigid rigid singular thing mm -hmm. is perhaps flawed in a lot of contexts yeah you know, there's a lot of people who, who a lot of people in the world who have dual nationhood just in their own personage yes in terms of i feel i'm a kiwi and i'm a and i'm a fijian yeah um you know, like it's not that uncommon a thing. No. Whereas Pichot does seem he's very prideful and he's very nationalistic and and he yeah. like he was one of the big outspoken uh, opponents of Jean Klein's inclusion in the he Ireland did. squad. He, he, Just he, that got got reported over here. He appeared on Off the Ball talking about exactly that. Yeah, I think. yeah exactly. Um, so yeah, that that would be a, a, a factor in terms of. Uh, just your the, the, the likes of but, Fiji. Well, what's, worth, but, what's worth noting is that um, uh, 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 
other tier two nations don't support it. Yeah. For example, Georgia would be very much opposed to it. And in fact, most tier two nations don't support it. Mm -hmm. And they would be fearful of it being exploited the other way. Yeah. You know, where you have Mamouka Gorgonza, for example, could be be, be. capped for France now because he qualified on on, on eligibility. Sure. And ripped away from from, from Georgia. Yeah. No, it's true. That's a massive concern of tier two sides as well. So it's there's two sides to that coin. For sure. Uh, but there's no question that with Pichot in charge of world rugby, it's one of the things that he's passionate about. So and it's one of the you things you wouldn't have be sway over. He, he, could, yes, he could definitely yeah. imp- he yeah. could impact he already has. Um, things. He he's definitely apparently has. responsible, in, at least in part, for moving from three to five years. There you go. Yeah, um, and that could could go out further again if he oh, gets yeah. the head like that. Forever! <laughs> yeah, indeed. Where yeah. are you born? <laughs> <laughs> be doing blood tests. <laughs> yeah, birth certs <laughs> at the ready. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, um, a kit bag and a birth cert to come to the World Cup. Yeah, um, um, but uh, yeah, so the, like th- those are the in, like those are the two candidates, I suppose. Yes. And it's it's tough to see. Like the the optimist in me does kind of hope that Pisho gets in there just for the f- the fresh blood of it yeah. all and just to kind of sh- to mix up the game because I don't see it moving very quickly with Bill Beaumont. Other than like, obviously things like mm-hmm. rule changes, it's hard to see Bill Beaumont losing it. And mm-hmm. I, even in watching him in interviews, he's he's very. Qu- quietly confident because he should be like 20 mm. of the votes are sewn up prior then yeah. you need 26 to, he's gonna, to he's gonna get the canadian vote obviously as well because their union has a lot of ties to the sort of old school six nations heads. Yeah. he's gonna get um it was already announced today he's got the rugby europe vote as well so um, which is a bit of a blow to p shows campaign yes, like he's, yeah. he's trying to champion the tier, tier two, two sides yeah. and if rugby europe oh it's out, like that's... for me it's completely short-sighted if you're a tier two side like i think you know, in the context of this election, a lot is being promised that can't be delivered. Yeah. Um. But one of the one of the, the really the biggest material difference is Pichot's champion of we're going to fundamentally restructure the voting system within the organization to make it more equitable. That's the biggest single change that could be done by either of them, and that's what Pichot advocates. And I think in the context of wanting the game to be global, ultimately, that's where uh, it has that's, to go. That's what we want, and mm-hmm. you know, a combination of that and not wanting to see Bernard Laporte near the authority of the game would have me favor Pichot's for sure. candidacy. However, I just don't. I, I my prediction hat. Is yeah. saying that it's going to be four more years of Beaumont and then possibly Laporte thereafter, oh, God, yeah. which is um, <laughs> an unfortunately. St- In I case you haven't noticed, I'm not a big fan. Yeah, um, yeah, but uh, what it is interesting, and it's definitely the the rugby news that's happening at the moment. Yeah, shy of a few transfer things here and there, and some injuries, I- injury updates. That's about the extent of it. Um, the things that they are on both manifesto are things like the champ, the Nations Cup idea, yeah, um, as well as the Club World Championship, which are it is definitely a, an idea with such promise but we feel that just like the structures that have been proposed yeah. are not tenable and that married with the uh, the global calendar they're trying to aspire for yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it hasn't been put forward in any kind of practical way nope. yet um, and, and, and and still not in the context of this campaign one of the frustrations that I've had throughout it is just that um uh, nothing has been gone to in, in anywhere near enough detail to have given me any confidence that any of these big restructures can, will happen, will happen yeah. anytime soon. So it's it's not as like it's not even though like you'll have P show is campaigning and kind of sometimes in vaguely revolutionary yeah. tones. It's hard to see him swaying things even if he does get mm-hmm. in in that much of you know, a capacity just in four years as head yeah. of the world of rugby. It, uh, I don't know how much he can change, yeah. especially with the plans they've outlined at the moment. And I suppose we will pivot on then because we we're, we're have two parts here. We just have a notion on the, the future of the game with that in mind. Yeah, this is sort of um, our, our own point of view on the future of the game. Yeah. What, what is in store and, and what do we think should happen? Yeah. Um, you know, obviously these guys are, are proposing a lot of big ideas. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess as, as, as good a place to any in terms of, of where to begin is just what, what are the problems? Why 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 does this game need to change at all? Why, why is there hearing? such a dichotomy? Why is, are the Sanzar Nations and the Six Nations games uh, nations at, at such loggerheads yeah, um, um, over like, this why why is there such a feeling of urgency that everything about this game that you know from a lot of fan perspectives is going okay yeah um needs to radically change um i like there's 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 a few i i would start obviously you, you mentioned the San, sanzar nations the rugby championship and super rugby are kind of becoming a bit stale they're struggling they're particularly struggling. super rugby yeah. the, the crowds at super rugby are not impressive no. um, the, it doesn't help that 
Australian rugby is on the wane and has yeah. been for the better part of 10 years in terms of just yeah. interest and investment. What also um, doesn't help now is that South Africa have one foot in the door in Europe. Yes. And they, that is a carrot for them. Like they, uh, I'm sure they've already known, like the Cheetahs are, are Curry Cup champions now and there's more of them. They've just signed back uh, mm. Franz Steyn and yep. stuff like that. Even though it's only the Pro 14, they see a window in and in a well, couple of years it, it could lead to the Champions it, Cup and then the big carrot is the yeah. Six Nations. It's um, the, 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 yeah, exactly. The Six Nations Nations offers more money. It offers games at better times for fa- for viewers. Yeah. It offers uh, it fewer offers... trips across the Indian Ocean and back, and yeah. across the Atlantic so and back. None and of this jet lag madness. Yeah. Um, but obviously, it, that would be like a final nail in the coffin for the rugby championship and Super Rugby and yeah. everything, which is um, no good. Really. So, so that structure obviously is suffering a little bit. Um, and then one of the issues that, that constantly gets brought up is just that the test game is so much more a financial winner at the moment than the club game. Yeah. But the proportion of, you know, club games to test games doesn't reflect that and gets even worse if you want to proportion it to, you know, club games versus test games that matter. Yeah. Um, you know, which is your Six Nations and your Rugby Championship and that's and basically the, the odds it. summer tours that are have interest. Like yeah. if, if England are touring the All Blacks, that's a profitable tour. Yeah, and obviously and the Lions, Lions tours. tours yeah. which, like a, a, a really perverse stat is that uh, the, the capital from the, or the revenue from a Lions tour is enough like from Australia? It's enough to balance the books of for their, twelve years. For tw- for yeah. 12 years. Otherwise, they're in absolutely yeah. in uh, in debt and in yeah. in the red. But it puts bumps them up to just in the green yeah. of profitability just from that tour alone. So that's something that you do want to protect, obviously. Yeah. But you need more money uh, to come in. One of the things that they, they did find in this last World Cup, obviously, is Japan. Yeah. Um, it's right there. It's 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 in a unique position to help because mm. they all of their club com- they have a domestic competition all of their own. And their their corporate teams. So you have the Panasonic Wildcats or whatever, and it's yeah, looking, yeah, yeah. like they actually have have a lot of money to offer. And the Sands Our Nations are are struggling for money. They just can't yes. can't buy a profit. That's sort of almost um, more obvious one. And I would say that the, the third big problem is just the state of tier two sides in terms of actually making the game global as opposed to paying lip service to it. Yeah, there is a state of perpetual decline in the sense that you know the the standard of of coaching and you know uh, player bases and um, you know, performance generally across tier one sides is growing at a rate that is quicker than the growth of the tier two sides. Yes. Yeah. And so the gap is wide. And that's to do with distribution of wealth as well. Yes, like of course, so it is. much of course more money. Like, and, and just in terms of uh, that is an area where restructuring does need to be looked at as yeah. well because the current structure just doesn't favor them at all. For sure. So th- those are the big sort of ongoing problems which have led to a sort of a stuck in the mud area where a lot of unions are struggling for money and the game isn't growing at nearly the pace that people would hope yes um uh, and that as so then it's it's sort of time to look to look at solutions um personally i think i just think we need to be careful about blanket change yeah um i i i totally agree things like the six nations like have to remain obviously they will remain yeah uh, like now there there can be a path for georgia georgia to get in obviously like I'm, I we're not they should be, they're yeah. thinking there should be like making it a meritocracy is great but the six nations should happen in its calendar yeah. situation it shouldn't be jumped around i think the rugby championship should stay as well i would lobby for the inclusion of japan in it yes and, and broadening that tournament the one yeah. the one that we kind of the elephant in the room that we haven't mentioned is that there's a test window in november that is completely Moot yeah, and yeah. pointless, really. Like, yeah, that's far the occasional, like the yeah. All Blacks come to play Ireland in Dublin, yeah. and that's obviously a game yeah. with atmosphere. But the week before, we play Argentina, and you can feel it in the you stadium. Can feel it not matter. You can like, and yeah. you can see it in Argentina's so, performance. It's the end of their calendar year. Yeah. They have nothing to play for. So, so um, this is this is our big submission, essentially, to yeah. you know where we think the conversation balances vis a vis global calendar and Nations League, etc., 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 and Nations League. Um, uh, the, idea. the idea as it was put forward had a lot of issues with it uh, you know, wasn't it 12 teams it was per, 12 teams yeah. it was it was way too much rugby it was it was kind of it, the, the thought behind it was poor it devalued the six nations in all kinds of ways mm-hmm. um, it locked in uh, a couple of teams tier two sides into the top 12 and yeah. then locked out everybody else and yeah. at times for a period of like two years where you're just not getting any games against tier one sides so mm. as, a, as, as a solution to the tier one tier two divide it was sorely lacking yeah um, especially so, considering what they want mm. like they're talking about and Bill Bowman yeah. had mentioned that in, in, in 20 years time or whatever in the next in the World Cup yeah. when in that we want more like we don't want the quarterfinals being the same where do we get the next Japan is his argument yeah. but like as much as we want another Japan 
what we really want is more Uruguay. Hmm. You know, like you want yeah, the yeah, pool yeah. games to be distributed. You want the tier two sides a, to be taking yeah. scalps off each other. There was a football um, World Cup recently, and I think it was like Portugal. Spain and England or something I can't quite remember the teams but it was like three big powerhouses and Costa Rica it was in Brazil yeah. and Costa Rica topped the group there you go yeah. and like that's obviously phenomenal like obviously every every sport suffers by comparison to soccer it is the most popular game in the world but that's but the that, vision that's the vision yeah really and, and the way bad. to accomplish that is not to ring fence 12 on top and, tw- and the rest yeah. below with mm. like because the, the issue is like the likes of Georgia aren't playing enough mm. games against the likes of England or the likes of yeah. New Zealand and how do you how do you format that how do we not mess with the calendar that much well the just, cal- the calendar put the thing about the calendar and this does need to be highlighted because just everybody you ask says we need a global calendar pundits you mm-hmm. know um even players organizations um uh, um, uh, um, candidates for a world, yeah, world sure. rugby. Yeah. Everybody is everybody is is purporting this idea. We need a new. We need a, a global calendar. Global calendar. Global calendar. Nobody. I, like I've seen one example of it put on paper. Mm-hmm. Uh, in terms of actually how how do you get this thing to work? Where it was like, uh, from a European perspective, the season started in February with the Pro Fourteen from mm-hmm. a Leinster perspective. Obviously, if we're just going through it from our point of view, then that ended in May. Then you have Six Nations, then you have a Champions Cup, mm. then you have yeah it was it was it's uh, it, everything was hap- it, it it was it was rushed is my point yeah and I just don't think that anybody has yet put on paper a workable solution for for that for or a, a way to make that work yeah it, it kind of worked in the Southern Hemisphere context they already started in February they just had Super Rugby end and then the test season begin which is actually what's happening with the current restructure where the where the summer window is is now in July instead of June yes uh, assuming normal times which obviously these aren't um so in that context I think you know, until somebody presents a workable solution, I would put that on the back burner personally. So would I. I, I don't, I don't see the necessary value, and I think this is one of the big areas where I think guys like Pichot could run into problems. Is just like with with with, with tinkering and fucking with the European game. You know, you could lose revenue. Things can get worse as well as better. I know yeah. things need to get better, but they they have a capacity to get worse. Yes, and the um, money is coming from massively the Six Nations. Yeah, a huge amount of money. A big chunk from the Champions Cup too. Um, yeah, top couturers in France swimming well, in money as there, well. There are issues um, with the Champions Cup not making enough money true. ever since the the. Um, the, well, it's not. It's not made as much as envisioned, which is another mm. thing to your to your point. Like they rebranded the champions, rebranded, Club, reformatted, reformatted, and hoped that it was just going to magic in a bunch of new money, and didn't, and, and didn't, and yeah. that's always a prospect with these things. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think for the time being, our submission, sort of to come full circle, how yeah. we contextualize it, is to rather than just change everything and hope that the new format works. Is to put is to use the use November the November term. Test series yeah. to have a Nations Cup that is not twelve teams; it's divisions of four teams. Yes. So you have Division One is the top four teams in the world, and then promotion and relegation from each. So yes. if you go Start. by the by the current world rankings, the, or the, even the, world rankings at the end of the at world the end Cup. of the World Cup potentially, yeah. like which is what they're talking of doing if they're doing the World Cup draw yeah. as well. But you'd have in Division One, you'd have South Africa, England. Uh, New Zealand and Wales yeah. uh, currently and, and that would be the top top tier and yeah, then, so and you, have a th- you have a window that's three tests and you, we've seen nations stretch it out to four tests it's mm-hmm. sort of dealer's choice as to whether you choose to have a final at the end of it yeah um, I don't mind either way I would ro- I would sooner see a round robin you can maybe do yeah. a final in, in, uh, in division one for, for the thing so yeah. that then like, may, well, maybe no, you don't like need that. to you don't need to do a final if not but you, you have your three test window, so you play. Um, you have all of those sides play each other. The side that ends up on the bottom of it, it goes down to the second division. The side that ends up on the top of the second the top of it wins the the world league, as it were. Yeah, it's different enough from the from the World Cup that it's not you know devaluing. It doesn't that devalue tournament. the World Cup. But, but what it crucially does is when you get down as far as Division Three, you have Argentina and you have Fiji and you have mm. Georgia all in that uh, yeah. in that little kind of bubble as yeah. well and that, that creates some great games it gives the likes of Fiji a chance to get mm. promoted to a division yeah. where they'll be playing tier all tier one sides yeah. for three games in the in November which is great but similarly you'd have massive relegation battles between England and Wales or something yeah, or, no, you, or you, pretend, like, you would have the capacity for colossal games 
and then you would have some shocks you'd have potentially teams like Ireland going down to the third division of yeah. humanity yeah. and then perhaps the next year you know losing against Fiji yeah. you know all of that could happen for the time being you'd have to think about how you would work home and away obviously usually the November window is, is played in, in Europe you could start it off just playing the games in Europe but obviously that tips the scales it does a little dramatically it does a little but what it does is improve on, on the November series which is yeah. is problematic for, for mm. many reasons definitely in the southern hemisphere people uh, people just don't value it like and, and yeah. even if but it's, it's like it's massive for a side like New Zealand as well who have found it exasperating um on occasion having seasons where you know they're just they just don't have enough games with money riding on them they yeah. win the rugby championship early doors if it's not a lion's year perhaps they have like a, a disinterested france touring them is how the season starts yeah then they go off to the rugby championship australia are at sea they win Bre- bledisloe at a canter you know get a uh, you know that famous season where uh, R- Roman Poit sent off Bismarck Duplessis and just like that the rugby championship is sewn up and the season is done yeah. um, whereas this gives like legitimate um, fight legitimate, to, to legit, the end leg- of the year. yeah legitimate something on the line as the end of the year arrives which I think is actually massive for a side like New Zealand Yeah, I think you probably would have to start with Europe just because there is a dependency on those November tests yeah to make money and if you keep there's it also, if you keep there's it also three, that's where the money is if you yeah. sell out Twickenham for a big yeah. game that's a lot of revenue yeah. you know like um, and if you if you keep it to three tests that does leave a window open for sides to arrange tests outside of the window which you know a lot of sides yeah, have liked to do in sure. recent times um, which makes all the sense in the world if you want to do that absolutely like yeah. if England for example find themselves in Division 2 but won a game against the All Blacks they can arrange that yes um, that, that'll be your last window I think you can, yeah, you can do something you can do like it that. after it's a cash, it's a cash yeah. grab but fine yeah. you know like and it would just it would improve upon the current situation it would mean that teams like Japan would be gunning for getting promotion and yeah. then getting like I would also would, mean like from a tier 2 point of view as well like I remember seeing a, a tweet recently from somebody a tier 2 fan who was just exasperated um like he was saying that this is a clip of a famous game between I think it was Zimbabwe and Romania mm-hmm. and it was in 1989 or something or 1987 perhaps it was the World Cup mm-hmm. but it was a 21-20 win for I think Romania right and like it was like this is a brilliant game last last time these sides have ever met yeah and met and how many you know pointless one-sided games have each of them played in their respective continents since then yeah it would be great you know it would be a great way to give those sides stranded sides like Namibia and Africa yeah. Um, games. Gen- genuine games. Games. It would give them sides of their own level. Yeah, three um, games of. Uh, like we were exasperated at the World Cup because Namibia didn't get their game against Canada. Yeah, and you know this would be an opportunity for them to do that, and and it's a way to make that happen. That exactly. Makes sense. It would also um, like it would it would like Italy may be cushy in in the Six Nations right now, but they'd be at risk. They'd be in yes. the at risk inv- community in that yeah. tournament because there'd be many teams fancying a crack yeah. at them. It's it would just it makes a whole hell of mm. lot of sense to us, and I just I haven't bar us put, dropping it in comment mm-hmm. sections on occasion things I've not seen it proposed or no, engaged with it because idea. everybody's obsessed with this global, global calendar, calendar which, which I just think is folly I really do I think I, well I haven't I, seen a workable solution no for it I don't I, I um, think the Six Nations is too valuable um, obviously like it's, it's also it's a summer winter would, thing there's a summer winter there's a seasonal aspect to this where mm-hmm. like you can't really change the planet and the fact yeah. that it's summer up in the northern hemisphere yeah, when it's winter there's a reality that you, like if you want to put the Six Nations in July that it's almost it can be too hot in France and Italy and yeah. London as well to play rugby. Yeah, um, yeah that's, that's, that's that's just a fact. Just fact. Um, and and it's it's also like you're and likewise, obviously, if you want to flip it the other way and and have you know uh, matches in Australia in December, pointless. Yeah. Like you, you know, and actually idea. a bit reckless as well because yeah, exactly. it's like it's just um, it. I I just don't feel like that's the solution, even though it seems like it's being peddled as the solution. What I do think is that this that this has much more potential to to like it means that you'd have all kinds of consequential games amongst all kinds of teams. You'd have a proper festival of rugby to finish off the calendar year, yes, um, which is great because international rugby, we're all agreed, is the money maker, which yeah. is one of the great things about rugby, like the fact that. Like it, it, it's one of the the, the, the the worst things about football, despite all the great things about it. The fact that the Premier League is so much 
better than watching international footy you yeah. talk to any football fan and they're going like is there any football on this week oh no it's an international break mm. so there's none whereas like yeah, in, yeah. in rugby that is the the opposite is yeah. true but and it, where it's becoming true perhaps a little bit is in November yeah um, and that is yeah, yeah that's trying to explain to a non-rugby fan why you should care about any November uh, games yeah, listen, is, is yeah. tough and like, it is we, tough and <laughs> it's an argument you have to have you, we, we, you do have on the regular like, no test rugby's are not friendlies yeah, yeah. test matches are not friendlies they're not friendlies yeah, but but what are they though? <laughs> yeah. It sure sounds like a friendly. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. All but of that. It, it, it could do away with that a little bit. It also maintains the summer tours, which are um, big in terms of tra- like. I'm not normally a traditionalist. In fact, mm-hmm. I like. I think traditions generally can yeah. be can be backward thinking and not progressive. But there is value to the touring in rugby. Yes. The, the, the aspect of it. Yeah. It's it, it is historical. Obviously, the Lions tour. There's yeah. monetary vo- value. To, yeah. Like uh, ask the Sands our nations about it. They're all obsessed with the Lions. Mm. South African fans I'm sure are yeah. buzzing for the Lions to come to them they're world champions now it's going to be a massive event when mm. it happens next year the summer doesn't really need to be messed up with every now and well, then you there's could, a, you could, there's t- a you could tinker with it here and there in the sense that you know uh, the current rugby championship format more and more doesn't lend itself to touring yeah and you know old school Kiwi teams and old school Safa teams do love touring they do yeah um, and so it, you you could conceivably have in July, you know, South Africa tour New Zealand only to play them later in the year. Like you almost get five tests in a year, like you would have in the old school days, and then maybe tinker with more European sides going elsewhere to perhaps tier two nations to that off to nice. the island nations that and some nice. off to the Americas. Yeah. You know, yeah, that'd be an interesting way yeah, of doing it. for sure. But I think that's also more back burner tough. I think yes. the, the pressing one is the one we've highlighted. November mm. test series. Yeah. Is, the other like, thing is that South Africa going into Europe, um, for me, starts to make a lot of sense. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, well, well, if that's happening, then there are things that people have to prepare for. The first big thing is if South Africa leaves the rugby championship, which is already on the wane, yeah. um, what is to be done with you know New Zealand and... Uh, Australia are they just bled us lowing indefinitely forever yeah which is not doing anybody any good no, at the moment and you're starting to see you know bled us low games with half empty stadiums which yeah. sucks in, especially in Australia obviously yeah um, you know if, in terms of world rugby solving Australia rugby's problems it's like, I don't think that the way it's, it's in kind their power. Of, it's kind of like I don't I don't see an obvious solution and I know Australia are backing peace show just because what else are they going to do we need radical change of some form because our game is in is on the wane yeah but like I don't see an obvious solution to Australia's no, problems. I see, Beyond, if, I like, see get, just get Japan competing. in there. There's more money involved, yeah. and there's competitive yeah. games and stuff, and so there's is, a whole yeah, thing. But is, that still doesn't solve possible, Australia. Like, um, no, it doesn't. Um, the only thing I would say is that you know there's a hell of a competition in, and and with less time zone friction in, um, yeah, Argentina, New Zealand, Australia, Japan, and Fiji. Fiji. Awesome, um, awesome tournament. That's right a five away. team tournament right there. Yeah. The only question is like. You know, you, if you've ring fenced Samo and Tonga out of it, what do you do then? And so that so that is a question. And then obviously the other issue is if South Africa go and join Europe, um, you know, it obviously makes the Six Nations a phenomenal competition, etc. Um, you can't have a Seven Nations. You can't kick Italy out really. Yeah. So that's where promotion relegation does have to become a thing. And I yeah. think in order to prepare for the potential of that day arriving, right now there does need to be a pathway between. Tier two and tier one, mm-hmm. um, the rugby, rugby Europe and the Six Nations, rugby Europe right. and the Six Nations, yeah. uh, exactly. And um, you know, guys, teams like Portugal and Spain need to be brought up to scratch, and then obviously Georgia have a level to rise as yeah. well. Yeah, um, all of all of that does need to happen, and that that takes investment, and that takes backing those horses and adding a pa- an avenue to um to to proper big TV revenue tournaments like for the Six sure. Nations. Yeah, so I sure. do think fundamentally that it's a good idea. Perhaps with a playoff or rele- a promotion relegation playoff, Probably just to, just to that, stop yeah. the, the you know the thing from being so jarring as to put a team that's out of their depth into the competition, they may have to win like a, a two leg playoff against Italy, Georgia. It would be Georgia at the moment yeah. against Italy. Yeah. Um, yeah, would have to win a, like a two leg competition. Yeah, against Italy to get potentially into something like yeah. that. I I think so. That it's it's definitely creeping um, that way. I know, like, and that could be played in the June. It's, it's what 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 it is is it's in South Africa's interest, and so that the Springboks are such a, yeah. a massive team that. Like it's also in the Six Nations. Like the Six Nations, yeah. as much as like we were saying, they can be rigid and protectionist. 
there are carrots that can attract that mm. kind of change and the Springboks are definitely one of those yeah. but I would still say that from, from the point of view of getting teams like Portugal, Spain up uh, Romania speed. up to speed it's yeah. the Nations Cup in November yeah. would would help yeah. enormously with that enormously and with that. then like there's one continent missing which is America obviously yeah. and now Argentina we've put in our you know this is obviously fantasy stuff in a little way but it's it's also potentially workable but Argentina we put in our tournament with you know the, they're the, still in the rugby championship that's where they are mm-hmm. at the moment there's a Pichot backed pretty cool tournament the Americas Rugby Championship yes which, which has, has Uruguay. It, it has, has the US, it has U- Canada, it has Uruguay, it has Brazil. It does. Um, who Brazil. are up and coming, even Chile, um, and yeah. then Argentina, and Argentina B side, essentially, yeah. who tend to romp it. Yes. Um, you know, that that's a decent tournament. That looks to be the way it's going. I liked the idea of the PNC, but it just doesn't seem like it's happening. No, it's not. Too, like, I, I it just they kind of yeah. go in with it and then they come out with it. Like, it, yeah. it's been great in years gone by, and then it's yeah. disappeared, and then it's come back. and yeah I like the yeah. PNC but obviously it's not solving any problems it's just a kind of a nice tournament yeah. and it's like a little like you're saying it's crumbs rather than yeah. rather than and it's, it's, no, it's no massive revenue generator no. it hasn't managed to capture anyone's in that imagination so from the point of view of the American unions I understand why they're backing the America's Rugby Championship sure. horse yeah. which can also work very well in conjunction with the MLR season yes um, and, yeah. and the MLR can feed a lot of those nations a lot sure. of those nations players can play in the MLR etc but in, in um, the meantime another thing that's happened since we've been gone is that USA rugby has gone yeah, and, has declared uh, bankruptcy Colorado's, like, Colorado's franchise have pulled out of the MLR yeah, as well. so it's like so that's a competition that's desperate for investment as well, yeah. as well. but I, I, honestly and you know I'm, I'm, I wouldn't claim to be an expert really we're podcasters in Dublin we, we do prefer to be breaking down games than these big concepts yes but uh, I honestly think that the, the, the sort of the right the right beats are being hit in the MLR that is yeah. actually the right approach like you're seeing little rugby community building in Seattle Texas, and it's that sort that kind and, of area. and Texas and mm. Sacramento as well like yeah. there's a few little pockets San Diego yeah um, where little rugby communities rugby is starting to emerge and not properly compete with the massive sports but little rugby communities are growing and growing and growing they have proper competition it's televised more more people are watching it's a slow process it can be a painful process it's important not to over invest and no. bankrupt yourself getting man on etc yeah but, <laughs> which yeah but there there though that they, their approach does make the most sense and is probably the best for long-term growth yes it's just not as quick as you know some of these like we'll we'll you know throw this competition aside and this competition aside and make this super competition and get loads of investors and then we'll be rich like it's it's they, it's it, it, it it's doesn't nonsense. actually work in yeah. terms of growing the game the tournaments like the MLR are massive and it just it needs to grow and it'll be slow and slow and America is such a and massive market with that so that many the, sports yeah. and, and, and it's, like it's, if, it's you're, if, you're grind out if you're CVC um, and you're investing in the Pro 14 yeah sure you want to get you want to axe the Southern Kings and get get an American franchise yeah. in there and get get all that American money but it's like mm, yeah, yeah I'm not sure how there, much money there is no. from American TV yeah. in that in that way you have to actually just build a support base exactly. slowly now that said an American franchise in the Pro 14 isn't the no, it's not the worst idea I've ever heard in fact and it's sort of like a Sun Wilson Super Rugby as a product like like there was a lot of dismissing of uh, and certainly comes from from premiership yeah. fans and, and from top couture's fans alike like mm-hmm. the fact that there's no relegation the celtic league and then pro 12 was often being dismissed i think the pro 14 with the south african teams is a much better product yeah. and it's a little window at the club level of, of what we were discussing and alluding to with the six nations yeah. potentially and um, but also just that, that globalization mm-hmm. of the game it has to be more incremental than that yeah um but the, yeah. the, the only thing is what what we've what we've left um you know it, it, well, the, the biggest the biggest proposal, as you say, is the November window because it it does it does give options to the teams we've left out because I'm conscious of the fact that you know Samo and Tonga aren't ready to compete in the Rugby Championship. No, they're not. And it would be. It wouldn't be. It wouldn't be much value in it to be honest. No. I mean, you could chuck them in there, but then you've a competition that's too big. You mm-hmm. could chuck it in, them in, then you have eight teams and then mm-hmm. split it in half. But then all of a sudden, well, it, the thing is, we have two great examples yeah. of 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 it happening, like Argentina. Earn as well as having yes. Pichot banging the drum, they earned their right. Like yeah. in, in the mid noughties, mm. that Argentina team were formidable. They got yes. a wor- they got to the World Cup uh, qu- yeah. uh, semi finals. They were mm. consistently and you could putting argue performances that, that in. Fiji having been to a World Cup quarter final, and Japan having been to a World Cup quarter final, it's time they played a big tournament. That's yeah. Uh, but so, but the point is that we've stranded Samoa and Tonga outside of our you know uh, arranged tests. They're, like there'd be no, there no 
you know, better or worse off than they are currently in our solution, but we haven't solved many of their problems apart from the existence of the Nations League. Yes. And likewise with Africa, which is very much its own entity, but it's just hard to imagine them fitting in anywhere else. Yeah. Which is why I think our idea of a Nations League in November, hopefully somebody proposed, somebody of value proposes Indeed, and yeah. it gains a bit of traction because I think it is fundamentally a good idea and I definitely think some form of Nations League wherein competitive games are being played by those teams who aren't getting the fair shake are important yes i also think it's important to note that you know while it's 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 popular in in our circle to, to rag on the tocators and you know club rugby in general it's important that we don't trash club rugby because club rugby is is at the moment the best um the best defense against tier two teams falling by the way so yes because it's an avenue for georgian players and Tongan yeah, players and really, samoan players uh, to play well, competitive Daniel, rugby even if they don't get treated is, right which they don't they don't they are actually playing well that was the stat, that stat that came up on rugby um, tonight uh, or rugby today even the other day that uh in tonga 20 percent of their rugby revenue comes from overseas professionals repatriating money their money privately yeah. Like that's twenty percent of all the money in yeah. Tongan rugby comes yeah. from that source, and like yeah, yeah. as wrong as that is on mass, it's also an indicator of the club game needs to be happening. The French game needs to be paying yes. these players but to play the game. But also, more is more is um, more is the more is the point. Even well, not more is the point. That's obviously important as well. But mm. it's 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 important. It's it's an avenue for them playing competitive rugby. Exactly. It's it's an it's an it's a an arena wherein Mamuka Gorgadza and Zirakashvili and you know. Um, uh, um, you know, Swanee Tongawea played in the Hining Cup final. Yeah. Um, Manu Samoa from Northampton, from an American point of view, and Nguyen. Yeah. Like, all through the history, like, these are the little windows outside of World Cups that they where, get to play where pro rugby. Play top level rugby and yeah. get a feel for it. And obviously, there's not enough players doing that nope. to, for them to be honestly competitive. But, you know, the way the Taka Tours is moving and the way the European rugby is moving, you know, it can get to that stage where it sustains them and hopefully the MLR gets to that stage as well. Sure. That it can be a really, really valuable entity. So, you know, trashing European rug club rugby, as mo like, let's be honest, most Southern Hemisphere um, proposals for a global calendar involve just, ripping like, up like European rugby. European club rugby is like a complete afterthought. Yeah. Like, they're just like, oh, yeah, those tournaments. Well, you can kind of put, you put one there and, and one there. Yeah, and it's like, well, actually, this is very valuable, not just for European teams, but for, you know, a lot of Tier 2 players as well. Exactly. This is what sustains them. So, yes, um, bread and butter stuff. And yeah. it's like, yeah, that's why you don't need to rip um, everything up. And that's where, in terms yeah. of Beaumont Show thing, we probably will end up being Beaumont and nothing will be torn yeah. up and very little will change. And we'll it's, be frustrated so what's, by what's, the slow What's ironic is that my, my ultimate advice here, we're, we're sort of, it's, it's meandering and rambling. And as you can tell, we don't have definitive solutions because it's no. hard to come up with them. But our instincts are, you know, at least somewhat protectionist in the sense that you can't go trashing the game. Yeah. And, but yet our, 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 our endorsement is thoroughly with Pichot because, you know, the, the, the form of protectionism uh, advocated for by this sort of Six Nations establishment does is wholly unfair to the two or three it sides is. and there's no Entirely way wrong. of dressing it yeah. up. And they're consistently wrong on this front as well. Like they're, they're, Their solutions for the global game are, are no better at no. all. Like yeah, I, yeah. I would sooner see Fresh Blood in Pichot try a few new things and then be ultimately frustrated with maybe the impotence of the position yes, overall yeah, and then yeah, yeah. have his hands tied. Why am I dictator? <laughs> 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 um, but, but even still, yeah. it would be a nice new look for the game. But uh, yeah, those are just a few of our thoughts on on the the kind of the game as it is right now and what we would do yeah. to change it. The main size of the one is that rugby nations thing. I really want yeah. to push for push for that. I, yeah, I hope a, it gets... a nations league in November is our big idea, mm -hmm. uh, and obviously more equitable voting within the establishment of world rugby is huge. Would be as lovely well, as well. At the end of the day, you know, n individual unions in these tier two countries are going to know what's better for themselves than you know the big wigs in the upper echelons of world rugby or indeed a couple of podcasters in dublin this is it. um, it's very true so um, but um, with that we will leave you here we'll obviously we will be back yeah, we, um, we, we will be back with other videos i'd love to hear by the way just uh, if if uh, for, for those who are watching if you do have ideas of your own i would love to pop them down in the comments we might chat about them a little bit in the yeah. next show you know there's an element of filler to what we're doing but there's also value in these conversations in the sense that we can stop and take a breath 
and assess the game as a whole. Yeah, for sure. Um, a macro view kind of thing yeah, rather it, than the results-based industry that we're constantly reminded we're in. Yeah. Every every post-match interview is just the same as the one before, <laughs> where it's, oh, next game mentality. Yeah. So this is a bit more of a chance for kind of big macro thinking, and it yeah. can get a bit waffly, but um, it's interesting. It, it can, of course. <laughs> um, but yeah, we have a couple of other interesting vids that we spoke about on the top of the show, ones on the All Blacks, uh, or ones obviously looking ahead to next year's Lions Tour. Which we is not just a cop out. There is value in doing yeah. it. Um, but we, we will probably retrospective when we find out that Beaumont won. We'll possibly do a, a retrospective <laughs> on that. Um, yeah, but, indeed. Uh, but if you've any ideas, thoughts on first of all on, on what anything we've talked about in the show today, any 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 opinions of your own on what what new structures could be put in place, any issues with anything that we've said, please let us know in the comments. We love the, the best thing about this has been starting cool conversations for sure. Yeah, um, yeah, no question. And then if you've any ideas for for other stuff you'd like us to talk about please please uh, th throw them in the comments uh, but we will be back we are back yes um, I'm happy to be so um, um, yeah we're... Ho hopefully welcome back and <laughs> um, uh, yeah listen uh, stay safe out there obviously everybody and um, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll all come through this and at some point in the future we will be watching and, and breaking down rugby in a, in a more normal context absolutely all right stay safe and wash your hands <laughs> <laughs> see you bye bye <laughs>